Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on today. He is the mayor for the town of Rosemary in the province of Quebec. Please help me welcome Mayor Eric Westram. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Eric, I'm going to start with the, the the basic question that I've asked every single political person who's ever come on the show. You're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I think it was something that I probably had in my DNA. I mean, when I arrived in Rosemary in 1980, uh, I bought my house, and the next day I was on soccer fields uh, helping young young people, and that basically gave me 33 years of coaching with the younger generation. So it's it's something to me that became very very natural uh, from a younger age. Was politics always something that you were interested in growing up? Was it discussed at the dinner table, or are you the black sheep of the family? And elected politics came to you at a later day in life. I think that uh, uh, a lot of people that get into politics uh, get through uh, volunteer work. Uh, you get to be known. Uh, the parents of the kids I coached basically got to know me, got to understand uh, my passion to uh, transmit uh, sports activities to the younger generation. And, um, you know, day to the next, uh, one day someone proposed a party, proposed to me to go in politics. And you know what? I said, if I can help my community at a different level, why not? So it was not something that I thought of. In fact, I would say that my uh, first impression of some politician uh, was surely not uh, was surely not the one I would have wanted to become. Uh, and I'll tell you that uh, I have a career of sales and marketing. And when people proposed to me to go in sales, I said, nah, I'm not going to go in sales. Those guys will say anything to sell you anything. And you know what? I made it a career and did very well. So in a way, you you follow your destiny, you grab the opportunities that are given to you and try to make the best of them. So what was it about local politics, municipal politics that drew you? Because you could have chosen federal, you could have chosen provincial, but at the end of the day, you chose municipal politics to get into. What was it about that municipal, that local angle that you said to yourself, this is where I the, the could best serve my community? To at different levels. I think it froze. So I understand the question. Basically, um, I had the opportunity to go provincial or federal, but I think that at a municipal level, uh, you have a direct, uh, first of all, you have a direct link with the community day to day, whether you walk your dog, whether you go shopping, I mean, you meet your citizens, you discuss all kinds of things that to them are important. And um, from the time you think of an idea and you put it into application, there's, it goes quickly. I mean, it's there's not a lot of red tape, a lot of uh, stuff that you have to go uh, through. So it's it's a action reaction. It goes very quickly. And but what I like the most about local is basically this this link you have on an everyday basis with the younger generation, the elderly, uh, uh, all kinds of people, all kinds of experiences that they share with you. Uh, there's some days uh, I think that I'm a psychologist because. What people want to do is just have somebody to listen to their worries. And that you get when you're on a municipal level. I'm not sure it's that easy when you're a provincial or federal because there's way, way more people that you're responsible for. And it, it, I think it separates you from, from the day-to-day -day, uh, link that, you, that I enjoy having with my people. You were first elected as a councillor and then re-elected as mayor in 2017 and then just recently re-elected in 2021. I want to go back to your first election, though, because I, I, I try to do research and I can't find the first time you ran. The furthest back I can find is 2005. What was the first election you contested? In fact, I proposed myself to be elected in 2002 and I lost by 30 votes. That was my first experience in politics. And I said, you know what? Uh, you never you never leave on a defeat. So the next opportunity that came about three years later, because uh, that year was three years later, not four years, but three years later, then I was given the opportunity. And there, basically, I mean, I won by by huge, by huge margin. So, uh, yeah. Do you, but you, you again, seem there was, to, oh, go ahead. 
it was proposed to me. I grabbed it. And from one election to the next, because I was elected three uh, mandates in a row as a city councilor, then became sort of the idea, uh, what do I do next? Uh, do I stop? Or so I sort of put myself in a position where I could go for the mayor and position and, and make the most of it. So basically, again, I mean, the stars were in line and uh, second mandate as a, as, a, as a mayor. And also first mandate as a... I'm not sure of the English word. In French, we call it le préfet. I don't know if it's prefect or warden. Uh, I'm responsible for seven other cities on a regional, a regional project. So basically, I mean, things things went well as as, as they came about, and here we go. So I want to talk about the warden aspect and the prefect aspect a little bit later, but I want to stick on to that first election, that 2002 election. Going into that election, you seem to know, have a pulse on the community. When you were door knocking and talking to your neighbors, were there issues that were being raised that you were not prepared to talk about or surprised that people wanted to talk about? I think after you've done uh, 10 or 15 doors, basically the same subjects come about. It's either uh, uh, people that are driving too fast. <laughs> it's either about snow removal garbage pickup, uh, my neighbor that has parties in the middle of the night. Uh, so basically, basically, you know, from one door to the next, uh, it becomes quite similar. So you adjust, you adjust your speech or you adjust uh, uh, your hearing capacity uh, to make people feel good. Because after all, that's what they want. They need somebody basically that can listen. And I've, I've always understood that the best communication tool that you have are your ears, way more than your mouth. Going into that ballot box, into that very first election that your name was on the ballot, what was that experience like for you? Because you never forget the first time you see yourself, see your name on that ballot and you can put that X beside it. For you, what was that experience like? And do you still get that chill or do you still get that air of what have I gotten myself into when you go into the ballot box and put your X beside your name each time? Very emotional, I will tell you. I mean, uh... Uh, I had my family, my entire family, my two daughters uh, involved into the campaign. Um, I was very proud of the fact, because if you look at my life story, I was adopted. And the name that I have today was given to me through adoption. So I was very proud for my father. I was very far. I mean, I was very proud. I mean, it's uh, and very emotional. I mean, you got tears in your eyes, you got shivers. And then you put the X in the right box and you just wait for the result. You have no control whatsoever on what's going to happen. And since I had lost my first election, despite the fact that the experts, the so-called experts that said, ah, Eric, don't worry, you're going to win. Uh, I knew that the, 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 the time I was going to wait for the result, I had no control whatsoever. So that becomes very scary in a way, because that's when you learn to uh, control what you can control. And for the rest, you know, it doesn't belong to you. And it still is, to answer your question, yeah, every election, um, different kinds of emotions, but same, the same, the same thrill, the same, especially when you win, you know, uh, when you win, it's, uh, you win, you win with your team, you win with your, uh, uh, with your colleagues, you win with your family, you win with the volunteers, it, it, it's, a, it's a crescendo. For 45 days, you know, you work the crazy door to door. Every night you gather together and basically share what you've heard. And But that day, when you see the results on the screen sort of become more and more in line to a victory, I mean, it's uh, pure exaltation. It's, it's, it's really fun. You, you get elected for your first time in 2005 and then as a counselor and then later on in 2017 as mayor. That night, that that uh, that little check mark comes up beside your name and say you are now the councillor elect or mayor elect for your community. How much weight automatically gets put on your shoulders to say, OK, now the real work begins. The last 45 days means nothing compared to what I'm going to go through for the next four years. How much weight and responsibility do you put on your shoulders each time that check mark goes beside your name and say now the now the real work begins? Uh, I'll share with you what happened to me the first day. Uh, I, I got into the city hall. Uh, I'm elected. Uh, I walk in with my briefcase. And before even getting to my office, I had gathered my 120 employees in a conference room to say, uh, 
hi, we're going to be working together for the next four years. And then, and then I get into my office, I close the door and I said to myself, what did I get? What am I getting myself involved with? What you talk about pressure. I mean, during the campaign, you just feel the pressure of winning. Once you've won, you say, yay. But once you get to the office, close the door and sit on that chair, you say, whoa, am I going to be up to the level that people want me to be at? So that, that, that becomes a very weird moment, but, uh, I mean, it lasted maybe 30 minutes. And then, and then you, you, keep, you keep on driving, but ooh. is there a different is there a different feeling when you're elected councillor compared to being elected mayor? Because as councillor, you're there to represent the people who have elected you in your district or ward. But as mayor, you're there to represent the town, the community as a whole. Is there a moment when you think to yourself, what have I got myself into as councillor? And why the heck did I just decide to go for run for mayor? <laughs> because now the real work that I thought was hard beforehand is going to be double or even quadruple what it was beforehand. It's an interesting question. Um, I knew that the level was going to be different. Um, but anticipating this, this change in responsibility and living it, you have to adapt and you have to adapt very, very quickly because let's not forget that as soon as you're elected mayor, I mean, the budget has to be voted in. So you're definitely, you're, you're, you're right into the, uh, into, into the, uh, the action right away. And the difference between a city councilor and a mayor, I mean, it's huge. The city councilor, uh, you're basically a councilor and depending on the mayor with whom you're going to be working, you feel, uh, you feel that, you're a certain level. Uh, I have to say that b basically the last mayor I worked with, uh, I became independent a year and a half prior to the election because we didn't see eye to eye. Uh, my style as a mayor, as, as a manager, is 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 very, very low key, very level. I mean, uh, people call me by my first name, except when there's a, a very important meeting with ministers. But to me, to me, like I said in the beginning, a title is not, I don't need my private place in the in the parking lot. I'm a very friendly kind of a manager. Uh, I get tough when I need to be, but most of the time, I mean, people respect me for who I am. And whether I was a counselor or a mayor, I was the same Eric to them, even though the level of responsibility became became much bigger. Uh, I feel more at ease in the role that I have now uh, because basically I can work with my team as before, as a city councillor, I had to follow the guidelines of my mayor then. And when you know not of the same, I wouldn't say the same level, but the same the same style, it becomes, it becomes different. But the first mayor I used to work with was very fun. Um, but I learned, you know, I think the 12 years I was a councillor uh, got me to the level I needed to be. Because uh, when you touch all kinds, all kinds of projects and all kinds of files, you know whether it's leisure, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's uh, uh, budget, money. I mean, it it gets you really aware of everything that you need to know. And uh, so I basically, I did my schooling for twelve years before getting to that level. You bring up a good uh, good question that I, I, I want to get into a little bit with yourself here because. You seem like a down to earth guy. You seem to, you, like you said, you're okay with people just calling you Eric and you don't care. Like titles mean nothing to you. Why do you think that is that more municipal politicians like yourself as mayor? And whenever I speak to someone in Quebec, whether it be a mayor or a counselor, they're the exact same way. What is it about the Quebec culture that makes people just feel, you know what? We're, we're just the same person. I'm just the mayor, but I really don't care of the title. Why do you think, why do you, and why do, Why does the Quebec atmosphere, and I'm not trying to play uh, politics here, just is comfortable with just being one of the guys and not being, oh, I'm the mayor and I, I demand respect no matter where I go? Uh, I would say in our, in, our, in our nature, being Latin, you know, the French, the French people, uh, like the Italians, the Spaniards, I mean, we're... We're, we're more of this people-oriented kind of, uh, of people. Um, my father was German. It was very strict and very, um, 
my mother was French, so I basically probably got that side uh, in in the way I am. But yes, I think the Quebec people are people that uh, in front of a glass of wine, in front of a beer, uh, uh, will talk to you. But they become friends very, very quickly. Uh, we're very open-minded, very, very uh, in need of this human link. Uh, I think it, it's in our blood, I think. It's basically, that's, that's the way we are. Mind you, I would say that I would not generalize the, the the English community as not being the same, uh, because I mean, whether you're English, French, Italian, I think if you're in politics, you need to be aware that people elected you, people give them give you their their trust, their affection. I think we're in we're in politics. In fact, we're in quest of some kind of affection too. This this wave of people that salute you in the street. Or when I get a loaf of bread. Five minutes away from my place, it takes me two hours. And the day where I won't get that exchange with people, uh, I will miss it because I mean that that's that's what drives me. I mean it's it's and I think it's the Latin uh, the the people that originate from Latin ancestors uh, are more key to to be that way. Um, so I think that in Quebec, I mean the, the French community is is very much like that. I I appreciate answering that. In an interview with one of your colleagues, uh, Mayor uh, Scott Pierce from the uh, Township of Gore, he talked about the negativity that has creeped in into the municipal elections in his area. Are you finding that in Rosemare as well, that there is negativity when it comes to the issues or the campaign styles that you see traditionally federally or provincially sneaking into the municipal politics realm? The, the last election was a uh, was a rough one. The last election was it because uh, of COVID? No, I think the last election was rough because there was a um, there was a party that ran against us that uh, were very pro environment, which is basically what's in fashion today, and that's fine. But they used all kinds of propaganda. They used all kinds of false information on me, on our intentions, and. Uh, for the first time, we found it very, very rough because there was a lot of negative stuff coming out of them. Uh, as as a group, we always said we will not fall into that danger zone. We want always to elevate ourselves uh, higher than that kind of politics. But um, yes, uh, and I think that in a way, the pandemic got people more demanding, more self-centered, more aggressive, for different kinds of reasons. So maybe pandemic is one of the reasons. Um, is it because of social more, media yeah. as well? Social media has oh. been on the rise in the last few years. And I'd say over the last, like when you first got elected in 2005 compared to now, social media has been a game changer in politics. In Rosemare, does does social media play a role in the in the day-to-day -day policies and the government uh, communications. And do you see the negativity creeping into that social media? The social media has been, how can I say? It's been, it's one of the, of the downfall of, 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 of politics and a communication overall. I mean, it's very easy for somebody on Facebook, on Twitter to just insult somebody Instead of just facing the person eye to eye and expressing their dis dissatisfaction, or it's very it's it's a very coward way of of of, of stabbing somebody in the back. Uh, so politicians, a lot of politicians I've known, have stopped politics just because of that, because it affects you, it affects the people around you, it affects your kids in school, it, it becomes it becomes very very a very nasty thing. So we always try to sort of get ourselves higher uh, at, a, at a level where we would want to be identified as, as part of those people. Sometimes the temptation is there, though. You feel like answer. You're there and you say on your cell phone, damn it, I mean, this guy has called me a coward. I'm not going to let him get away with this, you know. Uh, but no, you, you try to... I always said to myself that if somebody I care for insults me, that's going to hurt me. If somebody that doesn't make any sense to try insulting me, it won't have the same effect. So you try to put that in perspective. Uh, but yes, yeah, social media is not the best invention. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with your statement there, Eric. I want to 
now turn to my second segment because I am cautious of time here and I want to make sure that you are a busy man and I want to get this interview through. Um, I want to turn to the town of Rosemary as a whole. And before I ask this question, I want to preface this by saying this is a this is an opinion of the mayor. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is his opinion. We get a lot of emails and a lot of explicits when I ever ask this question to councillors or mayors. Mayor, Eric, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the town of Rosemary today as of recording? I think that the best, the best way to explain this would be how do we maintain the level of services that we have offered our citizens for all those years uh, in a very inflation mode uh, economy, a very unstable economic situation? Um, the the uh, the difficulty of hiring good people because manpower is is in demand. Um, the uncertainty of the world situation. Uh, all this being put together. Uh, it becomes a very challenging time of 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 of, of our of our time, and uh, we were always very conscious of every dime that we would invest or that we would spend, because it's not our money; it's our citizens' money. But to keep the same level of services with the taxation that we are asking from our citizens every year, it becomes more and more challenging. And the last year, I would say, was even worse because. We're talking about an inflation that got close to 7%, but in fact, a lot of the progress we need to buy to run this city <laughs> has increased by 50%. My, my, my filtration plant that basically produces a, a water, drinking water, I mean, the chemicals there have increased 50%. Uh, contracts of uh, snow removal have jacked up 25%. So how, how do you manage all this um, and still respect the capacity of people uh, to pay. Well, the interest rates on their mortgages have increased a lot, uh, where the uh, the food that they buy for their family has become also a challenge. So, if you know, Rosemary is a very, I can say, the, the, the level the level of of uh, of uh, of social level that we have in Rosemary is quite high. I mean, we we have people that make very good good money, have good careers, and all of that, but still. When you hear that people for mortgage uh, have increased by four or five hundred dollars per month on their mortgage, that the food has increased by twenty percent, all this being put together puts a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pressure on the higher middle class society, and that's that's new. I mean, before you had the low class, the high class, and the middle class, and the middle class that was running your economy. The challenges now are, are the middle class, and and we're feeling it. We're feeling it. You you talked about how you're the warden or the prefect of uh, seven communities as well. Now, as that role, would you say that is the same issue? That affordability issue is affecting those other communities as well. Yes, because some of the um, uh, cities in in our neighborhood don't have that same level, don't have the same society level. Some of those cities have people that are having it really, really tough. There's also a lot of demand now more and more for affordable housing. And that hits the lower middle class society. So yes, and, and that's and that's um, that's very interesting because once I get out of my comfort zone here in Rosemary, um, I get I get in link with uh, all kinds of, uh, of different kinds of situations. And some of them are really, really sad. It's, uh, and, and that's where you realize how lucky you are. What are you doing to address it, though? Because you're you're right. Things are getting more expensive to do work here. But your residents want, your community members want more services. They want better services. And you can only get blood from a stone once before it's dry, hypothetically speaking. What are you doing as council and what are you doing as mayor to ensure that you do bring more services by not cutting other services that other people may depend on? So what is the council doing? What are you doing to try to address this issue? Are you looking for grants? Are you looking for opportunities? Or is it basically just trying to make sure you do this financially sustainable for everyone to get ahead? Well, 
we we have a good relationship with the provincial and the federal governments. Uh, any grant that's available, we try to grab it. Uh, I have two people here at the city. Hall. Their job is mainly just to look at those grants. How do they apply to different kinds of, of, of things that we need? So uh, anything that regards infrastructures, anything that's build the asphalt, the pipes and all that, I mean, we try to get grants because those are very expensive and there are grants available. Government will not knock at your door saying, Eric, I got some money for you. No, no, <laughs> you, you really have to dig. You have to uh, go really deep into that cupboard to basically find them. So that we do, we do a pretty good job at it. We, and I'll give you a classical answer. I mean, we, we try to optimize basically uh, all of our services. We try to, to figure out a way to do great things the cheapest way we can. Um, and, and that, you know, when the times are good and times are great, you don't really worry about what I call the grease on the skin. Um, when times get tougher, uh, you start looking at maybe removal of some of that grease. Uh, it's sometimes a difficult thing to do, but we've, we've been able to do it. I mean, I was mad, I mean, the level of services have increased because the more you give, the more the people want. But um, uh, we, we try to, to invest the, 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 the money in the right places. And uh, we make sure that every dime that we invest is, is done the right way and respectfully. Now, flipping to the the other role that you have as the prefect or warden, um, you talked about affordable housing, and I, I, I'm I'm going to burst your bubble here, but you're not the only mayor or warden or reeve or councillor talking about affordable housing right now. It's a big issue across Canada. Um, the cost of doing business is getting higher. You you've openly admitted that. How do you, in that role, look at building affordable housing, but realize that the cost of doing business and building that affordable housing is a lot higher than it was four years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And this issue isn't going away and you're going to have to spend money to make this, these projects happen. What do you do in this situation? I think the only way is to get uh, help from the provincial uh, governments. If the are they a partner? Are they a partner in this work? Are they actually coming to the well, table? I think I think that what the provincial government is telling us, and it's <laughs> it's two opposite things that basically have to meet somewhere in the middle. They say you want to save green areas. You don't want to build or basically kill green areas, environment areas, and that's and that's a valuable thing. I totally agree to this. But on the other hand, you say you want to build affordable housing. In a city like ours, eighty-five or ninety percent is totally built. The only area that I have is a golf course that has been closed now almost five years. That has been bought by promoters that want to build on it. And I said, I'm sorry, you bought a golf course? You ain't building on it. But when I ask grants to the government to basically acquire this large green area that I have, they tell me, on the other hand, you want affordable housing. Where are you going to put your affordable housing if it's not on that green area? So you have to give in somewhere. <laughs> to obtain what certain needs are asking for. So it's it, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge. If I was a city that still had 50% areas that, that could be developed, well, then it becomes an easier task. It, it's not our case. I mean, we're 14,000 people in this community. And except for that 60-acre uh, piece of land, the rest is totally built. So what we've done is we changed some of the rulings on, on, uh, on bachelors, for instance. Before, in Rosemary, you couldn't have a bachelor in your house. You could have an intergeneration, basically, to welcome your, your parents and all that. But you could not rent uh, for, for, uh, for a single mom or, or somebody that has trouble financially. Now we've changed that, that ruling. That law has changed. Now we can welcome. So it's our little, I can say, our little thing that we're basically offering people to, to basically help out in people that live in certain situations. We're, we're quite aware that there are people that have done very well in their life and all of a sudden, bang, they lose their job, they go through a depression, they're going through rough times. So the healthy ones are the luckiest ones and it can happen to anybody. Next day, you can fall from high class to a, a lower class. So I think it's our responsibility to, to, to make sure that reasonably, we can offer something to those people going through rough times. 
I want to ask one last question before we uh, do our last segment here. And I want to know as mayor, how do you balance the needs of your community members? Because I can go to your community and I will be going to your community later this year. And I, I can talk to a hundred people in Rosemary tomorrow and ask them the exact same question. I started this, this segment off on, which is what is the biggest issue facing your community? They'll give me a hundred different issues. There'll be macro issues like healthcare, education, affordable housing, a cost of living, but there's going to be micro issues. And I want to talk about the micro issues, like the, the pothole in front of my house, the park that needs upgrading, the sidewalk that needs repair. But you will admit, and I, I'm putting words in your mouth here and correct me if I'm wrong, that you only have a certain amount of money each year to do your job, to run the city, run the town. Sometimes you're going to have to say no to people and do it in a way that makes them feel good that you said no to them. How do you do that as mayor and council? Look at the issues that people are facing and pick the winners and losers at the end of the day. Well, I think the biggest challenge as an elected official is trying to please everyone. <laughs> you, learn very quickly, you learn very quickly that it doesn't happen. So you got to prioritize. You have to put priority into things that are important and not important to you as an individual, but important to the community as a whole. Again, knowing very well that if you can satisfy 80% of the people, that's, that's very good. There will always be 20% of the people, 1% of five, that will find a negative thing to whatever you'll try to do. So that once you comprehend or you live with that, then it becomes easier. When you get in politics the first time, that's one of the first things you learn. I have had, you know, on my teams, I've had new people that came in and they wanted to do so much micromanaging. I mean, it became it became really interesting. So you have to sort of look at what, I, my, my favorite expression is to look at 30,000 feet up in the air and go downwards. You, you get a better view of what's important instead of having your nose basically in the gutter all the time. But, when, when you live in a city, and I always said we were very privileged in Osman, when people complain only about uh, the uh, the cover on the garbage can that's been eaten by squirrels, uh, when uh, the garbage collector basically missed one day, it has to come the next day because he had, he had an overload or, or, a track or a truck that basically had technical problems. When you only have those little issues to look at, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I think we're a very spoiled community. So basically, when you're a spoiled community, people sort of find little things that are important to them, but not the end of the world. Uh, but yeah, uh, once you've learned that you can't satisfy everybody and you, you find a way to say no to certain things, I have had people that told me, you know what, you, you should stop uh, having those uh, wood stoves. Because they have uh, emphysem, they have uh, lung problems or whatever. Um, but then you look at how, how for one person, because there are five people, how am I going to say no to that people? Because it's not a, a general problem. So I have to find a way. And when I said this basically before, you have to be a bit of a psychologist. You have to say, <laughs> yes, I understand. But it's not one of our priorities. I'm sorry. I mean, it won't be for now. It won't be for next year. As long as you're honest, and you don't sort of sell uh, what people don't want to hear, but you can't achieve, that's when your credibility starts going down. You have to be honest. You have to be straightforward. You have to be respectful. But you can't lie because people will remember. This guy made me a promise. It didn't fulfill the promise. And that politically is not the right thing to do because people will remember. And as a human being, if you're honest, you can't lie to people. And people finally understand that. I mean, people that said we should buy this next golf course, I said, sure, we'll buy it. Okay, how much money are you willing to invest? Oh, maybe $100 of taxes per year for 25 years. I said, you know what, you're at 30% of the total value of this piece of land. So, But you have to explain, you have to make people comfortable because to them, the subject they're putting on the table is important. Maybe to you, it, it's not as important, but you have to say, yeah, I understand, but it won't be possible. And you explain why. And most of the time you get away with the, with a positive conversation. 
I want to turn to my last segment now because I'm cautious of time. And I want to talk about tourism because I love tourism. I love visiting uh, communities and I like spending my economic dollars and tourist dollars in Canada where it's so needed, especially after the last few years. So, Mayor, what are some of the hidden gems my listeners and myself who will be visiting your community later this year should stop and see in the town of Rosemary? Well, I think what attracts mostly the people are, are marshes. We have at least four marshes. Uh, there's one specifically where you have all kinds of birds and, and turtles and uh, they're protected areas. Uh, we have people from surrounding cities that basically just go on Saturday and Sunday and walk through those, those areas, those wooden areas, those, those uh, very preserved areas. Uh, we, we're not exactly a, a known tourism uh, place. Uh, we've got excellent restaurants in the neighborhoods. Uh, we, we, we're close to the ski hills for the people that want to come in the winter time. But our charm here is walking through the streets. I mean, the environment, the trees, the flowers. We've won contests throughout the years, international contests, as, as, as a community in bloom. I mean, it's it's just, just spending a few hours walking through our parks, uh, taking a canoe and basically going on the river because whereas our city basically is on the, the Thousand Island River, you 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 feel something very very special. And when you compare yourself as you go on the river to the neighboring cities, and in all due respect, you see a different kind of place in Rosemont. And when people ask me why should I buy a house in Rosemont, I tell them. The environment, le côté champette, you know, what basically we got, we got trees. It's unbelievable the amount of trees that we have. Uh, the people, people, the, the, the way people maintain their, their flower, their, 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 their housing in the, the outside and all that. And um, with the services, we got five schools, primary, secondary, we got a train station. We, we got something to offer here at a tax rate that makes our neighbor cities very jealous. Very jealous, but as 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 a tourism area, I mean, just cycling, canoeing, walking, you'll feel you'll feel the rosemary, the rosemary DNA. It's 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 a very special little place. So I want to end on this question, and you kind of answered it in the last question there, but I want to point put it more poignant to you, and I've asked this to every mayor, and this is the ultimate question. This is the question that ends all questions. In your opinion, what makes Rosemary such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I will give you uh, why, basically, I decided to live since 1980 in, in Rosemary. I was raised in Montreal in a very densified area. And uh, when, I, when, I met, when I met my wife in 1979, in fact, March 10th, 1979, in Rosemary, at a party from our friends, Right away, I said, oh, this is a nice neighborhood. In 1980, we bought our first house. Uh, this very close-knit uh, community. This one of the only bilingual cities in Quebec. We've respected the people that came from other communities than the French one. Anything that we say, anything we write is in both languages. And despite the fact that when I arrived in 1980, 50% of the population was non-francophone. Today, they're about 14, 15% of the population, but we've maintained our status. The provincial government with their law has given us the opportunity to preserve it, and we jumped on the opportunity. Because here, we don't want any chaos. We don't want any fights over this issue. We live in harmony. So this, uh, for a lot of people, makes a difference because here you can express yourself in English, in French, uh, any of my council meetings, a uh, question being asked in English will be answered in English. We're all fully bilingual. And uh, to a lot of people coming from BC, from Ontario, from Europe, uh, find that this is a great, great, great advantage. Taxation here is the lowest, the lowest you'll find. So housing is very expensive, but when you take mortgage plus taxes, we're very competitive. The level of services, the schooling system, like I said, uh, Alpha School here where my kids went, uh, first grades and stuff like that. 
uh, it's a level I mean, you wouldn't it's unbelievable it's almost as good as private you get violent lessons you got sports uh, lessons everything so to raise a family uh you can have all the schooling system that you want you can take the train to see jep and your city as they get older um so yeah i mean it's uh I can sell my city uh, every every single hour of the day. I mean, I got all the tools. You you <laughs> sold it well enough that I'm like I'm looking forward to visiting later on this year. But I want to take a moment and thank you, uh, Eric, for sitting down, and taking time out of your busy schedule, and sitting down and talking about yourself and talking about your community. I say this a lot, but I I mean this with all respect. You you're you are your community is better off with people like you at the council table. So good luck in the future. I'm looking forward to visiting you and hopefully maybe grabbing a coffee when I'm in Rosemare uh, later on this year and just sitting down and continuing this conversation off the record. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much too. I mean, it was a great, great moment. And when you do come in Rosemare, let me know. We'll definitely go for a coffee. So with that, I want to remind everyone, get off social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people, for gosh darn it. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.